and welcome everyone to our Youth Speak on Climate panel. And thank you all for, for being here today. So my name is Daphne. I am the Youth Engagement Coordinator at the Climate Reality Project Canada. And I'm actually speaking today from Jojage, commonly known as Montreal, a site of meeting and exchange among Indigenous peoples. So as you may already know, this panel is one of several activities taking place as part of our week of action. The Climate Reality Project Canada recognizes the importance that youth have on fighting the climate crisis and that there is a unique opportunity for young people to reimagine their collective future and also create the change that they seek. So this is why we wanted to address different climate issues that are important to youth throughout this week of action, but also shed light on the importance of the climate strike that, it, that is happening tomorrow. So today is actually our last day of action before the global climate strike tomorrow. But we do have one last event tonight at 7 p.m., a fun sign making event at night where we can collectively prepare our signs for the climate strike of September 24th. So we will also be explaining impactful climate messaging and tell you more about why um, what we should try to communicate on our signs. So we are looking uh, for youth also across Canada to submit a blog post and get a chance to be published on our website and on Climate Reality Philippines website. So the topic for the blog post is what do you think about the importance of voting to address the climate crisis and what kind of government initiatives would you like to see implemented uh, to address this emergency? So I'll put the information in the chat if you like to have more details about these two events that are happening for our week of action. So let me put that in the chat right now. Amazing. Perfect. So let's get started. Today you will hear from some of our Campus Core students and Campus Climate Action Summit participants. Campus Core is our program that provides an avenue, um, a platform for students and with guidance to lead effective climate action within their campus communities. And the Campus Climate Action Summit was a seven week training for students interested in leading climate action. So you can head to our website to know more about our youth programming. So again, I'll put in the chat the information that you need to know more about our Campus Core program. Perfect. So today our participants will discuss the climate issues that are important to them and what we can do to solve them. This is an informal discussion, so please feel free to share your observations and comments in the chat. And we will also have a few minutes at the end if anyone wants to ask questions. So if there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, so let's get started. Jamie, the floor is all yours. Awesome. OK, so welcome, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll be hosting, sort of framing the questions, uh, making sure everybody gets to speak. Like Daphne said, uh, if people have uh, like comments, questions, and everything, there's a little icon at the bottom there to, to raise your hand, or you can leave your questions in the chat. If you're too shy or, or if you feel comfortable about something that's said or whatever, you could always uh, text uh, me or Daphne privately in the discussion part. Um, so that's pretty much it for the administration part. Um, I could present myself first really quickly. I was really involved in uh, youth climate activism. Uh, I planned a lot of student, student strikes sorry, in uh, 2019. Uh, that was across Canada and in Quebec. Right now I work as a regional engagement coordinator, so I'm trying to mobilize uh, people in regions uh, outside of cities in Quebec. Um, and I think we're gathered here today because youth uh, have a particular perspective of climate change, right? Because we will be the ones uh, living the consequences, but also facing these huge challenges ahead of us. So if somebody understands this issue, this situation properly and profoundly, it's youth. Uh, so on that note, I'll go through the questions really uh, one by one. Uh, but before that, we could introduce ourselves. Uh, so you could say your pronoun, where you're joining from, what you study in, uh, your connection to climate reality. Uh, and yeah, and you could pass the, uh, the ball over to somebody else after. Um, so Casey, if you're comfortable, you could start that off. Sure, thank you. Um, hi guys, my name is Casey Stein, uh, he, him pronouns. I'm joining from the traditional unceded territory of the Sioux Okanagan Nation, uh, as colloquially known as Kelowna in British Columbia. Um, I study philosophy, politics, economics at UBC Okanagan. Um, and yeah, ultimately I'm here today because I care a lot about the climate and I care a lot about a lot of political issues, but if we don't act on the climate and do more, none of the other things that uh, people are fighting for are really gonna matter. So I will pass it to Elena. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Elena Cox, and I am joining from the Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation land, also known as Waterloo. Uh, I'm currently a master's student here at the University of Waterloo studying sustainability management with a focus in indigenous conservation. And I am also a recent graduate from the University of Guelph with a degree in environmental governance and minors in political science and geographic information systems and environmental analysis. I was trained with the Climate Reality Project in 2020, and I also um, took a part in Canada's first uh, campus climate course, which just ended about a month ago. I'll pass it on to you, Sophia. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Sophia Linfield. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm joining you today from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, also known as Halifax. Uh, I'm in my first year uh, at Dalhousie University here in Halifax, uh, currently studying sustainability and political science. Uh, so very excited to talk about uh, all the different topics that we have going on today. Uh, and I got involved with a uh, climate reality project here in Canada. Uh, just this past summer, uh, I was part of their first uh, Climate Campus Core Summit that they did, uh, but again, ended about a month ago. So very excited to be here. Uh, and I guess I'll pass it off to Kaylee. To finish it up. Hi there, my name is Kaylee McAllister and my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently uh, located on the Haldeman track, which is part of what is currently known as Waterloo, Ontario. This is land on either side of the Grand River that was promised to the Six Nations as per the Haldeman Treaty of uh, 1784. Uh, I go to University of Waterloo, uh, same as Elena, and I'm studying environment, resources, and sustainability. I'm connected with Climate Reality Project Canada because I'm actually the regional organizer for the Climate Hubs Initiative in southwestern Ontario. I want to be a leader in climate action because I recognize as like a young white woman who has access to post-secondary education, I have an astronomical degree of privilege, and I really do feel an obligation to use that privilege to try and take care of the earth and the people that are living on it. I think I'm the last person to go. So I feel like that's back to Jamie now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting amount of uh, different perspectives gonna be joining in today. It's cool. I studied Swast about it in politics as well. So we have that in similar cases. Um, okay, cool. So I'll start with the first question. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo, okay. Yeah, so the first, one, the first one's a biggie actually. Um, so I'll read it out loud. Uh, word for word, the increase in recent forest fires in British Columbia, Northern Ontario, and around the world, like Greece, Turkey, and Italy, are just a few examples of how climate change is becoming more and more devastating. And, you know, it's, it's manifesting concretely around us. So the question is, if left unaddressed, how could climate change, how, how could climate change, sorry, further impact our lives in the future? So a big question, uh, and I don't think it could just only be answered in concrete uh, manifestations, but also socially, uh, so yeah, that's the first question. Does anybody want to go first or do I pick somebody out at random? I can go. Uh, cool. I think that if climate change is left unaddressed, uh, one thing definitely is there will continue to be an increase in extreme weather, like flooding, wildfires, and even more large scale disastrous events like tsunamis and hurricanes. And additionally, I believe that there will be a lot more pandemics um, and related health events like that, uh, that countries will not be able to handle adequately because they will be so large scale um, due to the changing climate that we're not gonna be able to handle it very well. And it's time to either prepare for that or address climate change better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think a better answer to this question is what won't the climate crisis affect yeah. because it is like it's such a huge issue that's going to affect pretty much every sector of our life so there's going to be extreme weather there's going to be more pandemics you know countries are probably going to become more isolated if we're going to have to be focusing on the disasters within our borders more than we're able to focus on like global citizenship um and then crops are destabilized and, you know food shortages so i think it's it's a really big complex issue that's going to affect a lot of really big complex things and that's why we need you know so many different people working on this issue in every aspect of society uh as we really we do need all hands on deck for for an issue of this magnitude yeah absolutely we'll be getting into possible solutions to after mobilizing stuff like that uh casey do you want to add anything or kaylee 
Yeah, I mean, I can just say I, I think a lot of people who are attending already know most of the answers to this question. Um, and I think Sophia put it pretty well in terms of what won't happen. But yeah, I think everybody said some of the general stuff. There's also going to be a lot of uh, migrant crises that's going to be going on as people leave the countries that are more heavily affected by the worst effects of climate change, uh, including the worst weather, uh, which people have already spoken about. And yeah, the political conflict um, is a big deal as well. There's even a possibility uh, as we see the lack of resources, you know, that's water is going to be the biggest thing, but also food. Um, as the migrant crisis continues, people are going to be leaving certain places to go to more pla other places that are more habitable. Um, and there could be the potential to have wars over those, you know, which is kind of tragic. Um, and we've been in a period of unprecedented privilege over the past 50 years. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the worse the climate crisis gets, uh, the more we're going to be departing from that. Um, yeah, inequality is going to be continue to be exacerbated, especially between countries that are uh, already uh, less developed and countries that are more developed. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of instability that's likely going to happen as well. And there are a lot of connotations from that. So when people ask me this question or when it comes up in academia or whatever, I think that it's really interesting because I would, it's really important to highlight that climate change, yes, is going to impact our lives in the future, but climate change is already impacting us so much right now. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying from climate change every single year. Um, in July, sorry, I'm getting a whole bunch of texts from my boss. I'm like, no, not right now, lady, but I apologize. Um, but a study came out recently uh, that demonstrated that 10% of global deaths can be attributed to abnormally hot or cold temperatures. And that's obviously only going to increase. So some of the people that are dying of climate change are dying in what is currently Canada, like the people who died in the heat wave in Vancouver, but most of them aren't. The focus on Western society in framing climate issues is a huge problem around the world, particularly in developing countries where they contribute the least to global emissions. People are being left vulnerable to the climate crisis because of unequal distribution of wealth around the world, which is largely due to colonialism. Climate change, I'm not saying climate change isn't gonna get worse. Climate change is gonna get worse and climate change is gonna get a lot worse. And these people are going to be left even more vulnerable, but it is already so bad. And just because we aren't really the ones facing the disproportionate impact doesn't mean that we, like as individuals, but also people working towards climate action in the developed, I don't really like that word, I'm using air quotes, but you can't see, developed world, doesn't mean we shouldn't acknowledge it and doesn't mean we shouldn't care. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, you guys really touched upon the uh, the social justice aspect of climate change, right? The disparity of consequences that will come out of it. Um, and also, I think Sophie really brought up a good point of how uh, within our own borders, when people are going to face these sort of survival questions, we're going to close on to our own interests. Uh, and that could create a lot of international conflict. And uh, Casey brought up the question of war and stuff like that. And yeah, it's, you know, we really... Yeah, we're going to face a lot of political turmoil uh, in the close future. And uh, yeah, I'm happy yeah, you guys understand the concept really well, of course. Uh, anything else to add by anybody before we get to the next question? Yeah, I just wanted to add one point onto that is that, for instance, like a lot of the conflicts that we already see in the world are already based off of resources, especially in the Middle East, where water is, a, is already a huge issue and has been for a while like a lot of conflict globally can already be attributed to, to scarcity of resources. That's only gonna to continue to be exacerbated as, as there are fewer resources and, and the climate becomes more uh, difficult to balance. Uh, so we're already seeing the effects of that. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pull a fastball. I'm gonna ask you guys a question that wasn't in the list because I feel like it's connected right now. Do you feel like a majority of people are aware of the things we just mentioned uh, and that includes politicians. Uh, and why or why not? So you guys aren't I think I, sorry about this. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to say I could answer that. And I think that there's a few different uh, answers to that question, depending on which population you're analyzing. Um, there are some people, especially with some of the disinformation on social media, that I think definitely uh, don't believe that these impacts are real. Uh, or aren't aware of them, um, as evident by the rise of the alt-right throughout the world. Um, but I think also something that would be good to focus on is that there are a lot of people that are aware of these impacts, 
and ultimately don't know how to deal with uh, the feelings that come up with that. I know that I have some friends who uh, frankly are a little bit overwhelmed by all the stuff that we've talked about, you know, because that's a very difficult thing to hear all these negative things that are going to happen. Um, and that's a very hard thing for people as individuals to reconcile with their own mental health and being able to, you know, like live each day. Um, and I think for me, one thing that I think should be focused on more, and I'm starting to see an increase in this, is uh, the need to, you know, reconcile mental health with climate change um, and the, you know, the direct relationship that exists there. And really recognizing, you know, it's, this is also was true over the Cold War, where it's like, um, we're facing existential threats, we can only control ourselves and what we can do. Um, and we want to, you know, fix the whole world, but we're, it's just, we're unfortunately don't have the power to do that. So we can only do what we can and we can do our best. Um, but I think that's one thing that's really um, having a big impact on the, the kind of apathy that exists. Um, in terms of the, the actual politicians, uh, I don't know that it's as much that, as much as it is more of like a pragmatic type thing uh, where they're kind of just stuck in the, I need to get reelected uh, or I need to fix the country uh, and, you know, really uphold the status quo in a lot of ways. Uh, and that ultimately leads to a lack of radical action. So. Yeah. Something that I think is important for, oh, sorry to jump over you. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that something I think is really important kind of in this discussion in re regards to, you know, there's still being people who, you know, still aren't convinced that climate change is an actual phenomenon. The important thing to realize is that the, ma the vast majority of people do believe in climate action and want strong climate action. I think something like 80% of Canadians want far more climate action than exists in this country. And an important part of this is to look at media coverage of the climate crisis. And I saw a statistic on social media the other day where it said that within 10 minutes of Jeff Bezos's trip into space, he had received more climate, more news press than climate change had for the entirety of 2020. And that's something that I find shocking and horrifying, obviously. But then also, if you look at what, what the content is that's being around the climate crisis, a lot of it is focused on, well, some people still don't believe that climate change is a thing, even though that's a really small portion of the population. But because media is such an influential part of our lives, we think that that percentage is far higher than it actually is, when in real life, a huge amount of people want climate action. I think this is a problem in politics as well, because I think that, you know, a decent amount of politicians are aware, certainly in some capacity of, of the magnitude of the climate crisis, but they're often able to get away with not doing anything because the argument we often get is, oh, well, the whole population is very divided on this subject, when in reality, we're really not. Canadians are ready for this change, and we were ready for it five years ago, and we're only continuing to be to be more ready for this change. So, so I think it's really important that we do continue to pressure our leaders to say, hey, you know, it's not, it's not as divided as you think it is. We're ready for this. So, so start, you know, representing the people, like the democracy that we're supposed to be. Absolutely. Uh, Kaylee or Elena? Anything to add? No, we're good. I do not have anywhere near as much as Casey and Sophia just contributed. That was amazing. Um, but one thing I think about people's understanding of the climate crisis is I think often people view things as isolated incidences, incidents, I, I think it's incidences. Um, that was unfortunate instead of trying to view it from like a systems thinking perspective that understanding the climate crisis really requires. Like it's not an isolated incident of there is a conflict or an isolated incident that a community doesn't have access to water. These are all related to climate change. And that's why climate justice is so important because climate action, the, the requirement for climate action isn't just about the fact that our climate is changing. It's about the fact that there is deep seated inequity in the way our world has been created since colonialism became a driving factor that has led us to this. And climate action that excludes people, climate action that just perpetuates capitalism isn't going to solve the problem. And without systems thinking and without flexible thinking, I don't really think that people are going to be able to understand that. And I think the problem is with a lot of media coverage, you have 150, like you have 
a very limited amount of words. Journalists don't have a lot of time. So this is where people get the majority of their information. So it's very difficult to communicate that to the general public. Sorry, Sophia, did you, were you saying something? I apologize. No, no, I thought that I hit the raise hand button and thought it was, you know, one of the reactions because I wanted to put up a little heart because everything you were saying was so good, <laughs> but it wasn't there. And so I accidentally raised my hand. Wonderful. That was all I had to say. Sorry. Yeah, beautiful. I, I got goosebumps. It was so adequate. Good job. Um, yeah, there's like this pattern coming up, right? Where we were talking about how the message has to be systemic, but that message can't really go through because the medium is media and media doesn't have the time or media is stuck in a capitalistic system. Uh, and like Casey had mentioned too, uh, politics serves its own interest at a certain point and politicians might be aware of these kind of things, but it's outside of what they actually want. Uh, at least I think that recaps what you guys said. Uh, and during that time, Elena pulled out a pretty sweet mug of R2D2 and it did not go unnoticed. Uh, okay, so I'll jump into the next question then. Um, so yeah, it's actually pretty adequate with the flow of the conversation too. Uh, now more than ever, we see youth talk, taking a stand for climate justice, uh, like in the case with all you. Uh, so why do you think climate strikes, like the one that will be uh, happening tomorrow, are so important? And we can even open that to a more general question of why do you think uh, youth climate action is important or what kind of effect it can bring. Does anybody want to start? I'll, I'll go. Or no, Elena wants to go as well. I'm happy to pass it over to her because I just talked a lot. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, I'll, go ahead, Elena. Um, I think it's really important to show stakeholders and policymakers that youth are investing in their future and the future of future generations um, that deserve to live on a safe and clean planet. And I think that climate strikes are a great way to mobilize like-minded people and show that this topic is one that's cared about and that needs to be addressed very quickly and firmly. Yeah, my point was kind of off of that is I think climate strikes kind of serve two purposes in my mind. So it serves as a literal physical representation to people in power that, hey, we're literally flooding the streets with people who are in support of more action and your inaction will not stand because we are, we are all together standing against this. And I think it also though, kind of going back to the point that Casey made earlier about, you know, eco anxiety and mental health around it, I think it can be a really helpful thing for people within the, within the climate action movement to see that they're not alone in it. Because I, you know, have struggled with eco anxiety a whole bunch and feeling like I'm the only one who cares about this issue. And just seeing that there are literally thousands of other people, millions of other people around the world saying, we agree with you, this is not right. We need to change this. I think it can be a really empowering thing for, for people who are working within the system as well. Cause it can be really hard work cause it's a really scary, big thing, but knowing that it's not just you who are trying to change these huge systems to, you know, create a better world, I think is, is really inspiring. Um, yeah, go ahead, I, Kayla. Sorry, were you, oh, you said go ahead, I apologize. Okay, so I think it's very possible that Sophia somehow has access to my Word document with all of my notes and she literally just stole it from me and plagiarized and rattled it off. Um, the only other point that I had that she somehow missed, I had three points, she only had two. Well, please, um, there you go, there you go. Perfect. Um, I think that climate strikes are really valuable. Um, she kind of touched on this a little bit. They help us network and kind of build a community. So number one, that can help us strength, strengthen existing initiatives because you can meet someone and be like, hey, this is the group I work with. Hey, this is the group I work with. How can we collaborate? But also it's amazing to build a community because often even in my program where I'm studying environment, I feel so isolated because I spend so much of my time, like I'm vegan, I walk everywhere. Like I spend so probably like 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week working on climate issues. And I just see a degree of apathy. And I don't think that's wrong. I think that what I do probably is too much because honestly, as one person it's good that I'm trying to make a difference, but me being vegan isn't going to solve everything. So I'm not judging people who aren't, but it's so nice to go to the climate strikes and see other people who are living similar lifestyles to me. And I really feel kind of understood because generally people are like, why are you eating a veggie burger? Why are you walking into class when you could borrow your mom's car? Blah, 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 blah. I think that's fantastic. 
I really appreciate it. Elena is someone that I have found this community with because we are working towards creating an on-campus program at Waterloo, which I'm super excited about. But yes, I don't want to steal anyone's time. Casey, if you have any thoughts. I think you guys have summarized it up pretty well. And I, I know I have more to add to the next question because ultimately, yeah, it's, it's about raising public awareness and community building. And I think that is a really interesting point that I haven't thought about. Uh, which is that this is a good way to cope with eco anxiety is meeting other people at places like these climate strikes. So I really liked that point that was brought up. Definitely, you could hop into the next question right away if you want, Casey. Uh, yeah, I'll let I'll let you ask it first if okay, you want to. Cool. So. Yeah, yeah, if it's connected for sure. Um, so aside from strikes, how would you like to see youth and other people mobilize for climate? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, there's really something really particular for me uh, that I have in this approach. Um, I take a very pragmatic approach that maybe not everybody necessarily has, but the way I look at it is uh, 75 to 80% of carbon emissions come from four sectors. They come from transportation, manufacturing, uh, buildings and power plants. Um, so that's a lot coming from four specific sources. Uh, and ultimately, I think that these climate strikes are really important, and I think the protests are important, but I think it's also important um, that we focus on the specific policy areas that get addressed as well, because I think that there's not enough uh, discussion about that. You know, um, The reality is the United Nations isn't the one that regulates power plants. Uh, shareholders don't set fuel efficiency standards, and the federal government isn't the one that uh, sets building energy codes in Canada. Um, there's a finite number of decision makers, there's executives uh, in those four industries that, that I mentioned, and there are regulators uh, in the federal government and primarily provincial government. Um, so really, I think the process that needs to be taken is um, after figuring out who the decision makers are for each of the sectors, figure out how they operate and what's the most effective way to apply pressure on them. Um, what's their statutory power, how they get their jobs, um, you know what the boundaries of their power are um and who has influence over them is a big thing as well um so i think lobbying personally i i have a very biased view for sure and i think that that's part of why we have panels is we can have different people with different views uh because for some people you know there's other areas that are more appealing um and that they think have more power but for me i definitely think um lobbying officials and kind of getting them to divert cash flows from fossil fuels to clean energy and having arguments that uh, make them think it's their own self-interest and not just because you want it but because they should want it too um, there's a lot of economic incentives for why you should uh switch to clean energy and ultimately those those arguments in that math gets pushed down um but if that math gets really circulated around uh that's a very great uh powerful thing that can be used because i think politicians do act in their own self-interest um and that's, I guess, one area where we can come back to the climate strike, which is, you know, bringing awareness to these realities that aren't discussed enough. Um, so I will turn it over to somebody else. Yeah, I just wanted to follow on that real quick because I am very much in agreement with the importance of uh, economic uh, approaches to to climate change because the reality is we do live in a world that's pretty much controlled by money. In whatever sector it is, money is involved with it somehow, and we then end up, especially in capitalist societies, where the businesses are running the show more than our elected, supposedly accountable officials are, and they're not accountable in any way to the people. So while there are ways to do that through, you know, creating demand for green products and making sure that you're boycotting, you know, super awful products, um, there's only so much you can really do as an individual, especially when there continue to be government subsidies for, you know, supposed dying industries and less support than uh, for newer industries such as uh, efficient energy. Uh, but then my, my kind of secondary point to, to go with that is that also super important. Again, there's so many different ways that this could be addressed. And one that I'm personally very passionate about is making sure uh, that we are using our elected government to our best advantage. Uh, and I think that's a really big part of that is mobilizing young people. Cause I think young people are such a, you know, untapped resource, especially with our involvement in government and getting, you know, not only young people to vote but getting young people to run is something that I'm super passionate about because there's, there's a reason that politicians in this country 
usually focus on issues that older people care about because older people go vote. Older people have money that they've saved up for many years. They're, they have a full-time job. Usually they're contributing economically. Whereas youth do not unfortunately have any of those persuasive powers to get politicians to care about them. And therefore, you know, youth are less likely to vote for someone where who they see as not understanding or focusing on any of their priorities. And I think that, you know, rightly so, that, that's fair. So I think a really important thing is encouraging young people to, to go out and be that candidate and show young people that there is someone who's at least trying to get into government who does have your interests at heart. And I think we should be doing this across all parties, you know, regardless of, of specific values, but especially on the climate crisis, I think this is, this is super important to have young representatives from a generation that has been ignored in government for way too long. Beautiful. Uh, Elena and uh, Kelly, do you guys have anything to add? Uh, I'll just add, um, I agree with a lot of what both uh, parties are saying. And um, for me, what I would like to see is um, related to what Sophia was saying, I'd like to see more youth directly involved in policy decision making, uh, like including uh, youth groups, petitions, forums, and hopefully uh, directly in Queen's Park and the House of Commons. I also, not unlike Casey, have a very strong bias that I did already disclose. I am uh, the regional organizer for Climate Hubs, which I will elaborate a little bit more on now. It's pretty pretty straightforward. So basically, um, it's an or a program run by Climate Reality Project Canada, where we're trying to enable municipal groups, like citizen groups, trying to lobby their municipality to set reduction targets, ideally in line with IPCC targets. Um, and as that is my area of interest, that's specialization, sorry, I can't pronounce right now. Um, I am very interested in municipal climate action. I think I would love to see more young people specifically engaging in municipal climate action initiatives and joining our climate hubs. Municipal climate organizing is so necessary and also extremely, extremely rewarding. I absolutely love working with my municipality because unlike your MP or your MPP or your MLA who aren't necessarily around a lot, they have a lot of constituents, your counselors are much more accessible. I knew my counselor before they were elected. And I love emailing them and be like, hello, Malia, how are you doing today? Blah, 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 blah. Um, that being said, municipal climate organizing is often dominated by the older demographic. Young people have a lot to offer and it would be really amazing to see them get involved, especially in an area where they have so much ability to make tangible change. Yeah, I just wanted to add a quick point to that. Uh, municipal uh, uh, governments and, and action within that is something I've been wanting to get involved with for a really long time because, you know, in Canada, 50% of our emissions are controlled at the municipal level. So it's a very effective way of actually seeing like real life on the ground change happening. Um, and I also uh, have, it's, it's a bit more mystifying to, to outsiders, I think, and the provincial and federal levels. You know, government at all stages is very complicated. But for me, this is something that even in the past year, like I had no idea how I would even begin to begin bringing up an issue in, you know, municipal government. And it's supposed to be a lot more accessible to the people. And I feel like, you know, we should be circulating that knowledge uh, about how to access it so that more people know. I just wanted to say, I, I really agreed with uh, both of what Kaylee and Sophia said about the, the municipal, the advantages there, because it really is more accessible. Um, you know, you've got more of the party structure at the provincial and federal levels, but I really agree so much, like people don't focus enough on lobbying local officials and the impact that that can have, so. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, my, my mandate with Climate Reality is to mobilize municipalities uh, oh, wait, I'm going to read what Kelly's saying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's a huge potential at that level. And I think it's unexploded so far, especially by youth. That's an extremely good point. Um, another curveball coming your way, guys, okay? It's, it's not on the list, but I think they were touching upon uh, the very delicate subject of whether or not we have hope uh, or we believe in our political system. So if I had to ask the general question of, do you, do you believe that the transition needed could come 
via our political system right now in Canada, would you say you do believe or do you not believe? Is it more of a grassroots thing, et cetera, et cetera? Big question again. Is anybody brave enough to start off? Oh, this one's tougher. Um, Go ahead, Elena. I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, no. <laughs> I think um, maybe if more people that are passionate about saving the environment, like youth, are more involved, then yes, with our current local system and um, uh, the current voting that we just did, I don't, I don't believe that um, things will be accomplished as quickly as they need to be. Yeah, I think I think this is a really tricky question because the thing about democracy is that it often takes you don't have one person who is just making all these decisions and it's like we're going to do this, this, and this. We're going to do it right away. We're going to do it now because you do need different perspectives. You have to go through, you know, all the different traditions and forms of voting. So democracy is a really slow way, unfortunately, of getting stuff done. And it even it's even more slow to then change that democracy uh, and build up a new system. So I think my, my answer to this isn't really yes or no. I think it's more of, we don't have time necessarily to create a whole new system from scratch as much as you know we might need it. So I think the answer to this question is more, let's make do with what we've got, do the very best that we can and not leave any avenues you know, not used. So while the political you know, atmosphere in Canada might not be the best way to be getting climate action done, and we absolutely should know, be pursuing grassroots movements, be pursuing NGOs, working with businesses, all super important things, we also can't neglect to be working in politics as well and need to be you know working on that front and and trying to make the difference that we can make within the system that already exists because uh unfortunately we don't have the time to reconstruct a whole world and make new systems in in time to, to combat this crisis i completely yeah. agree with sophia sorry i keep speaking over people who is speaking no, no, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to, I want to throw the ball to you guys, so go ahead. Okay, um, I completely agree with everything Sophia said. I know that I am like hyper fixated on 2030, but I feel like it's really helpful to have a concrete date. 2030 is eight and a half years away. We do not have time to overhaul and our political systems are completely insufficient. First past the post, hot mess. Don't know how that's still a thing, but we don't have time to fix first past the post and first past the post perpetuates many problems that we have in society beyond climate related problems, but we need to work with the systems we have. And I think Sophia also touched on this again, but it's really important that we don't just focus on politics. I particularly am very interested in corporate sustainability and it is my belief that it doesn't really matter what, it doesn't really matter what policy does to a degree because we really need to get corporations on board. And I'm not really sure how we're gonna do that. Maybe Elena will know as she is doing her master's in sustainability management, maybe she will have all the answers for me. But I think it's really important to emphasize exactly what Sophia said. Number one, we don't have time to overall have overhaul everything. So we need to work in the systems we have in place. But number two, politics aren't the only avenue and we need to think innovatively and we need to think flexibly and we need to think creatively because climate change is a hard problem to solve and to solve a difficult wicked problem as we say at the University of Waterloo in the Faculty of the Environment you need to think creatively and innovatively. I think this is an amazing question and even better answers um, because it is such a challenging thing to answer because I think the reality is um, there, if we changed our system completely to a much more ideal system, we would be able to do a lot more. But the question is, how much are we able to change in terms of the actual system? I mean, how much can we actually, you know, mold the outcome of whatever the new system is uh, to be what we want it to be? Um, and it's so challenging. And I think it is really a matter of like what everybody said of we have to be creative. I, I think one thing that uh, can be observed from people who have opposed climate action um, as an American, something I've observed is how 
creative uh, and unified the Republican Party has been. Um, and that's, uh, from my perspective, unfortunate. Um, but it's also something that's worth analyzing because they have been so consistent and consolidated in their views. And they've also been very creative. They haven't just looked at, okay, we're going to pass policy at the federal level. They've hijacked the court systems um, and they've hijacked state legislatures. And I think that's really an amazing point that uh, Kaylee brought up that it requires us to be creative and to, and to figure out what we're going to do. And, and if we don't have time to completely change our system, how can we work within the system and, and kind of like, you know, use the system to our advantage? Because frankly, uh, what, you know, people uh, who have been opposing climate action are using the system for is not what the system was designed for. Uh, they're do using it very differently than what it was designed for, but they're also getting away with it. And that's something that, you know, I think uh, about climate change need to focus on a little bit more. And I'm really glad to hear this discussion about it because it is like, yeah, um, we, we need to be creative and, and we need to figure out the, the best ways to actually um, get these things changed. Okay, beautiful. Uh, for a curveball, you guys have the best answers. Um, so now we're going to a more concrete question uh, concerning the uh, strike tomorrow. So now we just talked about if we believe or not, if in, you know, in politics on a federal system. Uh, the next question is, what are your demands for our elected officials during tomorrow's strike? So what are you guys looking for tomorrow? Anybody want to go first? I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, so my, my demands is both simple and, and not simple. It's, it's complete and unequivocal climate action in every single sector of government. They can possibly, anything within government power that they can be doing to help avert the climate crisis, start doing it tomorrow. It needs to be treated like the emergency that it is. We reacted with COVID, obviously not perfectly. There were still issues with how we reacted to COVID, but at least we were acknowledging that this is a global emergency, that we need to work with our partners within our borders and with our international partners on to do as much as we can as quickly as we can. And I feel like anything anything less than that, while still, while still great that you're still gonna make an effort, but that's what we need if we wanna avert this crisis and, and we can't be mincing words that we, that we don't need that because Otherwise, we're not holding you accountable. The whole point of this large demonstration is to show you that this is a large issue that you need to start taking seriously and, and treat like the emergency that it is. Uh, I can go. Uh, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet because we only have 15 minutes left, but uh, my demands would be to declare a climate emergency and work more actively to address climate change and reaching international targets that have been set specifically through conservation and divestment from fossil fuels. Come on, it's time to invest in renewable energy. Ooh, not pipelines. Also an interest in, in keeping it short and sweet at the federal level, I would really like to see an end to fossil fuel subsidies. I think uh, Trudeau's election promise was by 2030. I would personally like it to be uh, September 24th, 2021, uh, around 4 p.m. That would be nice. Also canceling TMX would be wonderful. Um, Trudeau's government does a fantastic job of rhetoric and rhetoric is beneficial because the federal government is a precedent setting institution. When that rhetoric is climate positive, things do get done at other levels of society, but it would be wonderful if you could, I hate the word talk the talk and walk the walk, because I think it's just so corny and weird, but he would, I would love if the government could just walk the walk on climate action. I agree with what everybody also said, and yeah, I want to keep it short and sweet. Um, I think acknowledging that there's a climate emergency and maybe also acknowledging that we're the only species to ever cause a mass extinction. I probably bring that up too often, but I feel like it's because other people don't bring it up enough, but I find that's something that's really significant. Uh, and when people actually start admitting that and acknowledging that, that can kind of uh, change people's frame of reference perspective. Okay, beautiful. Um, I could, okay, so we could either go through a question you guys really care about. If there's one of the following questions that you really had a good answer for, uh, if so, let me know. Because if not, I have another question that's on the list that I think could be very useful to finish up the discussion. 
So do any of you have a question? Go ahead, Sophia. Oh, no, I'm just gonna say up to you. Okay. So I, I got this, I got asked this question often when I was a spokesperson for the movement in Montreal in 2019. Uh, and it used to frustrate me because it happened all the time and I found it was kind of cheesy. But I realize now as a witness of more student-led movements, it's kind of useful to uh, spread hope. So the question is, well, you guys seem hopeful. You guys are fighting. Uh, and it's a, big, it's a big question, but why do you guys still have hope? Yeah. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> good question. A really good, very short answer. I have hope because what other option do we have? Yeah, no, that's kind of similar for me. And I'm still not entirely honestly sure if I do have hope for, you know, real, real actual hope that it's going to be possible because it's huge. Like, this is the biggest challenge that our generation and past generations are going to face within the next hundred years and that humanity has faced in a really long time. Um, so there are certainly a lot of days where I'm like, you know what, I, I don't really have, have hope at this point, but I think to go off of Kaylee's point, if you, the alternative is having no hope at all and doing nothing. And at least, at least if we don't get 100% preventing the climate crisis, at least we know that we tried and we mitigated some of its effects. And a graphic that I find, I know I'm going a little bit long, but I found a graphic uh, on social media that was shared around, I think Climate Reality Project shared it as well. And it was showing the percentages, which I found super helpful. If we admit, if we cut our emissions by this amount, this is the direct effect that we're predicting will happen. And even though ideally, we're going to be able to get to those targets and prevent you know, a total climate breakdown from happening at all. It still is a measure of percentages. It's not like, oh, if we, if we you know, reduce it by half of what our goal is, it's still going to be complete collapse, the same as if we're continuing on business as usual. Because the truth is, everything that we do does have an actual impact. Even if that means that like 100 trees don't break down in a fire, forest fire, I think that's still a worthy thing to have preserved and your action still does have real real consequences even if it's not the 100 percent prevention of a climate crisis that's something i find my answer not answer <laughs> this is a oh sorry i i was just going to say this is another awesome question and i have a very probably unconventional answer to it but it would start with uh go to therapy um, I've been in therapy for years, uh, and I would recommend everybody should go to therapy, honestly, um, because one thing that I found for my personal journey, uh, and this is going to get a, a little bit personal, but it's ultimately something that I think, uh, I remember discussions with my former roommate about is I've dealt with my, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is basically, I have these terrible fears about the worst possible thing that could happen to me in my personal life. Uh, and the way I've learned to cope with that. Uh, through the therapy that I've gone through um, is exposing myself to those fears. And instead of kind of being like, oh, well, you know, that won't happen. It's like, well, okay, what if that does happen? Um, and ultimately, once you kind of practice mindfulness and recognizing that it's a therapy, there's no substitute for it. But once you can kind of recognize like, okay, these fe this fear is an emotion and recognizing the bodily sensations that you have when you feel that uh, and realizing that ultimately, I, I think the the most important thing that we can do is live in the present. I think that's so powerful because if we look at our, our parents and our grandparents, uh, they lived through, you know, 40, 50 years of uh, where it seemed like nuclear war was inevitable um, and they were able to survive through that. And if you look back to like before democracy or really before uh, the past 50 minority communities um, today, they're going through a lot of stuff like that's really, really messed up, um, but they're still surviving. And I think that's one thing that, uh, it's just kind of amazing about, about the human spirit is that uh, we are able to get through a lot of adversity. And that doesn't mean we're not going to suffer because we are. But um, I, I really do think that it's important to be able to live in the present um, and, you know, lean on the people who you care about and who care about you. Um, and yeah, go to therapy. That's the other thing I would say. So yeah, I, I would say there's no substitute for doing all those things. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I also went to therapy specifically for eco anxiety because it was becoming such a such a big thing. And a really important thing that I just wanted to add on this is that 
especially when it comes to the climate crisis, your fear is a rational reaction. This is not like a crazy thing to be like, oh no, the planet's in danger. I'm scared about that. Like that's completely normal. If the whole world reacts the way you were reacting, we'd probably be in a much better place. So just, it's a completely rational reaction to have and don't be, don't be scared of that, but don't let it control your life as well because you gotta, you gotta live in the present. Yeah, really uh, well said. I, it, it, it was personal, but I honestly believe that when you speak about the truth and you actually go into depth about how you're feeling and stuff, it actually moves the conversation forward. So I appreciate that a lot, guys. Uh, Alayda and uh, Kaylee, do you guys have anything to add? It doesn't have to be as personal if you guys don't want to. Good. I, uh, I will add about being hopeful. Uh. I don't know, yeah, I guess it's hard sometimes, especially when you feel uh, pretty alone in like the things that you're doing and you're saying, oh, am I even making an impact doing these things? Uh, it can be pretty bad um, when it comes to being hopeful, but I think things will mobilize together like the climate strikes and you know, volunteering with groups of people that have the same interests and the same goals for uh, climate change. Uh, that's really where I feel most hopeful. I stand by what I said earlier. I don't think there's any other option. I like that. Okay, cool. Um, and so we have a few more questions to go. Um, there are more concrete stuff because we have to remember that this is being recorded and shared. Um, and I think the last little question is gonna be useful for people watching. Um, for example, what type of support and amplification do you need from other generations? So I think that if you had a message to send to other generations listening right now, that would be the time. Um, does anybody want to go first? Yeah, I'll say that I definitely think youth are making the push towards addressing climate change, but it's important for our older generations to understand the importance of addressing climate change now in order to make the world safer and even just habitable for their children and their children's children. And if older generations can't really support climate movements, then it's the future generations that are going to suffer. Yeah, my biggest thing on that is just amplify youth voices and listen to us and trust that our experiences are real experiences because in so many sectors of our society, young people's experience in life is not really taken as anything important. And I think that's that's a really sad thing because I think, you know, while we might not have the years of wisdom that we've gained, and that certainly is a really valuable thing, we do have perspectives on life, especially when it comes to the climate crisis that is so unique um, and can't, can't really 100% be understood by someone who's lived the majority of their life not fearing about what their future is gonna look like and whether they'll get to retire someday. Just because there's so much uncertainty as a young person, like how, how do you plan for your life in the traditional way that you, that you used to plan when you don't know what it's going to look like? So I think just, just understanding and taking us at, at face value and saying, that sucks. Let me help you with that problem so you don't have to feel like you're going through it alone. And I think that's the biggest, biggest thing you can do. Yeah, I, th I think what Sophia and Elena have said is so true and kind of just like listen to young people more. And, and I think that there's also possibly like this this bias that's come with older generations of what well, we've gotten through, you know, the Cold War and all the, you know, we, we won World War II. And so like, we'll get through this. Um, but like Kaylee said earlier, this is a wicked problem. This is not like another problem that we faced in the past. And I think if uh, older generations can acknowledge like, you know, that that perspective in past uh, problems that the world has dealt with is a little bit different than the problem that we're dealing with now. Um, I think that would be great. Um, yeah, so just being willing to listen to us. And another thing too, is a lot of the individuals who I do uh, interact with in terms of the, the climate advocacy world are retired and are putting a lot of effort in, um, in their free time, which I think is awesome, you know, because when you have, if you have enough money that you don't have to work every day, uh, there's something new for you to do, you know, help save the world. Because um, some of us have classes that we have to go to every day as well. So 
yeah, but I, I definitely think that there's, you know, uh, we need more unity and for people to be able to listen to each other. So.